Emily Kaufman, who's going to tell us about uh, revisiting the exploration exploitation trade off. Thank you, and thanks for the invitation. I'm glad to, to be here. So, uh, the multi armed bandit problems that I'm going to, to talk about, what should I do with this? Uh, no? Okay, sorry. So, the multi armed bandit problem, which is uh, the focus uh, of this talk, is often associated with the need for an exploration exploitation trade off. So the first goal of this talk is to contrast this objective with that of pure exploration in which we relax the constraint to maximize the reward, rewards while discovering the, the best arm. And we will see that sampling strategy for both objectives are quite different indeed. And then uh, I will revisit the simplest possible approach for solving this exploration exploitation dilemma that would consist in first an exploration phase of possible random length, followed by an exploitation phase in which we would commit to play the arms that were decided best in the exploration phase. And in a particular case, I'm going to characterize very precisely the suboptimality of such approaches. But before, a quick recap on the multi armed bandit problem, although you might be uh, familiar with it. So it's only a bunch of arms that are probability distribution. So arm A has mean mu A. And then there is an agent interacting with these arms and deciding at time t to draw arm AT. After which, he observes a sample XT from the associated distribution. And of course, his strategy for sampling the arms has to be sequential in the sense that arm chosen at time t plus 1 must depend only on the past chosen arms and the past observed samples. So the generic goal in such a multi arm bandit model is to learn which arm is best in the sense of the mean. So we, we are looking for identifying A star, the arm with highest uh, mean. But this learning uh, constraint can, this learning process can have some constraint. And actually, one of the most uh, considered uh, problem would be that of regret minimization, in which the samples that are collected are viewed as rewards. And in such a case, it makes sense to have a sampling strategy adjusted to maximize the reward uh, uh, we get. So here in expectation, because of course the rewards are random. And this is equivalent to minimizing the regret, which is defined as uh, uh, the, the difference between uh, the accumulated reward with an oracle that would know in, inside the best arm, and so he gets T mu star reward, minus so the expected sum of reward with our actual strategy. And this rewrite as the sum over the arm of the gap between uh, the mean of the best arm and the mean of arm A, multiplied by the expected number of times uh, an arm A has been drawn up to time T. So we have this uh, NAT notation. So to minimize regret, we of course have to do an exploration exploitation trade-off. So exploration because we need to draw all the arm to have a kind of an estimate of their mean, but we would want to focus on the best arm so far because we have this constraint to uh, maximize uh, the, the reward. So just to, to give precise example, a pure exploratory strategy would be simply to uh, allocate your budget evenly between arms. So this is of course bad because every suboptimal arm is drawn a linear amount of time and so of course your regret is linear. And so on the other end, a pure exploitative strategy would be, well, first sample each arm once and then go with your current estimate of the best arm. So that is if uh, mu at t denotes the empirical mean of the re rewards that you observe from arm A, then you choose the one with highest uh, empirical mean. And this is also very bad because with probability 1 minus mu star, the first time you draw uh, the best arm, it gives you 0 and then you never play it again. So a better idea would be to mix exploration and exploitation. And the first idea is to start with exploration and do exploitation next. And so uh, first we explore the arm uniformly. And then, so we commit to the empirical best uh, so far. But what we shall see in this talk is uh, whatever the stopping rule between this exploration and exploitation phase, this is not as good as strategy mixing exploration and exploitation. But first, let's go back to the motivation on why we may want to minimize regret. So I'm going back here to the example of uh, Don Stoke on, uh, on Monday, about clinical trial. Uh, indeed, the arm would be here some uh, Bernoulli random variable that would model the efficacy of a treatment across patients. 
And then in a medical study, one has to decide for patient T which treatment AT to give him. And in an ideal world, we assume that we directly observe a response, uh, XT equals 0 and 1, depending on whether the patient is healed or not. And the probability that is healed is the unknown success probability of the treatment. So in this framework, minimizing regrets amounts to uh, maximizing the number of patients that has been healed during the, the study, which makes sense, of course, from a medical perspective. But what, what we also heard about on Monday is that uh, saving patients is not the goal of a clinical trial, so according to this Belmont report. And indeed, uh, the goal might be rather to sample the arm in order to most efficiently estimate which treatment is best. So you would uh, allocate the treatment to patient in order, for example, to identify as quickly as possible the best treatment. So I don't say uh, I agree, but the idea would be like in early stage clinical trial, you want to find the best treatment because the idea is then this treatment will be given to a much larger uh, population. Anyways, this uh, permits to introduce the two bandit problems that I'm considering today. So I already talked about the regret minimization problem in which you have to build a sampling rule such that Given the horizon T that you may or may not know, the goal is to minimize the regret up to this horizon. And uh, as opposed to this problem, I will introduce a particular best arm identification uh, problem that I defined as follows. So first, I'm not going to have only a, a sampling rule. I'm also going to introduce a, a stopping rule, so to randomly stop the experiment when I, uh, I think I have identified the best arm. And then I propose a recommendation for the best arm that I denote by a hat. And then the goal would be, given a risk parameter delta, uh, make sure that the probability that your recommendation is accurate with probability larger than 1 minus delta, while uh, minimizing the expected number of samples needed to make this recommendation. So the expected number of patients you have to involve in the, in the clinical trial. So this is one example of a pure exploration problem. So there are other uh, variants of this in the literature, yeah, like do you fix the budget and want to minimize the probability of error, or you minimize simple regret. But today I'm going to talk about this so-called fixed confidence framework. And in this talk, I'm going to uh, present an optimal algorithm uh, for both uh, objectives in a problem-dependent sense. That is, for on any given uh, mu uh, bonded instance, I will achieve some uh, optimal rate. And then we will discuss at the end of the talk the performance of uh, explore and commit uh, strategy. So this strategy trying to use pure exploration tools within regret minimizing algorithm. And in all the talk, we will focus on simple uh, bandit instances in which the distribution of all arms are parameterized by their means. Uh, and so, for example, in the Bernoulli case associated to the medical trial example, or uh, you can assume Gaussian distribution as in the previous, uh, as in the previous talk. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, the, the model is entirely parameterized by this vector of mean uh, mu. OK, so let me start by optimal algorithms for regret minimization that are by now quite well known, but I, I, I quickly uh, recap them. So I just remind you that the regrets can be rephrased in terms of this expected number of draw of the suboptimal arm. So of course, to have low regret, you want to draw only little the suboptimal arms. But there is a well-known uh, result from Lion Robbins that tells you that all the arms should still be drawn infinitely many, and they give a very precise rate for this, uh, the growth of these draws of suboptimal arm. And so this result is expressed in terms of uh, an important uh, information theoretic uh, measure, so the kullback leibler divergence between the uh, distribution of the arms. And so we will introduce the notation D of mu mu prime as a KL divergence between the distribution with min mu and the distribution of min mu prime. So in the Gaussian case, this is simply related to the square gap between the means. But in the Bernoulli case, it takes a, a little uh, more complex uh, formulation, uh, but still, uh, still explicit. And so the lion robbins results tells you that for every uniformly efficient algorithm, so an algorithm for which the regret would be small on every problem, uh, the expected number of draws of a suboptimal arm A up to time T is uh, asymptotically lower bounded by log T divided by so the, the kullback leibler divergence between the distribution of arm A and between the distribution of the best arm. And so this motivates the definition of an asymptotically algorithm 
uh, that, uh, uh, such that for every bandit instance, uh, the expected number of draws of A is upper bandit by log T divided by D uh, mu A mu star. So I'm going to give you an example of such algorithm among the well-known family of UCB types of uh, algorithm. So those algorithms are very simple. They just compute one index for each arm that happens to be uh, an upper confidence bound. So the idea is that given the past observation you have from the arm, you can build, a con you can build confidence interval on the unknown mean of each arm. And then you act kind of optimistically by assuming that the true value that you don't know is the best possible value. And in such a problem, you would pick the arm with largest uh, UCB. And of course, in order to get an asymptotically optimal algorithm, one has to be careful in how we build uh, the UCB. And here I give you uh, the, the UCB index that would yield an asymptotically optimal algorithm. So you see that. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, explicit, but it is built using the divergence function d that appears in uh, the lower bound. So in the Gaussian case, uh, d is very explicit, so you get exactly the, an index that resembles the famous UCB1 algorithm. But in the Bernoulli case, you have to compute this by uh, looking at the function d of mu at k uh, and then thresholding it at a level log t divided by uh, the number of uh, observations. So this is still uh, efficient to, to compute. And it can be shown, so using a <laughs> Chernoff method and some refinement, that this is indeed an upper confidence bond with probability of order 1 minus 1 over t, which is roughly what you need for the analysis of UCB. And it would prove that this algorithm is such that the expected number of draws of a suboptimal arm A up to term t is upper bounded by log t divided by the right constant plus a second order term that I don't detail. So we have our optimal algorithm uh, in the sense I defined for the, the regret minimization problem. So the best arm identification problem has been a bit less understood, but for, for recent results, we have a, also a, a characterization in some regime in which the risk would be small of what I would call an optimal algorithm. And the idea will be similar. We will try to get a lower bound, so this time on the number of samples needed for the accurate recommendation, and then try to have an algorithm matching the lower bound. OK, so first recall that a best time notification algorithm is three things. So still the uh, sequential sampling rule, the stopping rule, and the recommendation rule. And as we don't know mu, we will want that for every possible bandit instance in our class, so Bernoulli, Gaussian bandits, and so forth, the probability that uh, the recommendation is indeed the true uh, best arm under this model is larger than 1 minus delta. And so with Aurélien Garivier, we recently gave uh, a lower bound on the sample complexity, so the expected number of samples needed of every uh, delta pack algorithm, telling that uh, so the sample complexity is smaller than t star of mu times roughly log 1 over delta, where t star of mu, so this characteristic number of samples, actually can be expressed using some, uh, the solution of some optimization problem. So here we have the supremum over all probability vectors, over all proportion of draws somehow. And here we have the infimum over all bandit model lambda uh, for which the optimal arm would be different of this quantity. And this quantity can be uh, interpreted, as we shall see later, as a cost of uh, transportation. But what is also interesting when we look at the proof of these results that I'm not going to give here, also it's three lines. Um, we can see that here, if you take the argmax, so if we define as this vector w star of mu, it can actually be interpreted as the optimal proportions of draw of the arm, in the sense that any algorithm that would match the lower bound should satisfy the following. So the, the proportion of times arm A has been drawn should be of order this quantity w star a mu. And we also actually propose an efficient way to compute this solution that simply resort to solving a 1D optimization problem with, uh, with standard techniques. OK? And uh, what I'm going to show you now is simply, uh, so because we had in identified the optimal proportion, we can artificially design an algorithm uh, that will force the, the proportion of draw to converge to, uh, to this target quantity. And that's what we do here with this uh, tracking. Yeah. Why is the inf not zero? I didn't get it. Um, 
Well, you have to consider uh, all the possible uh, bandit model in which the optimal arm is not, uh, is not the same. And for example, this inf, you can say that it is the minimum of the inf when uh, arm 2 become larger than arm 1, arm 3 become larger than arm 1. And each of these optimization problems, you have a, a closed form, uh, close form solution. I can't take lambda a to mu of a? No, no, because uh, you don't satisfy this constraint. You have to change the optimal arm. Because in mu, the optimal arm is 1, and you have to propose a lambda in which the optimal arm would be 2 or 3 or something. So yeah, this is uh, the, all the alternative uh, uh, possible bandits. Uh, OK, so now building on this, uh, the solution of this optimization problem that we can compute for all mu, uh, actually, we propose to look at time t at your current estimate of all the mean of the arms, the mu hat. And then we start, you start by looking whether there is an arm that has been drawn less than square root t. If this is the case, uh, then you draw it. So this is some kind of forced exploration that will guarantee that uh, the, the empirical means are actually going to converge to their true values. And if there is no uh, underexplored arm, uh, we choose uh, the arm that maximizes uh, the difference between t uh, w star of mu hat uh, and uh, the number of minus the number of draws of a. So it means that we are going to compute the vector w star uh, for our empirical mean at each round. So we have this uh, procedure to be, uh, to be uh, efficient. And it's not too easy to see that this tracking rule will make sure that um, uh, the fraction of draws of A is going to converge to the target W star A mu. And so finally, the algorithm that we propose, uh, we call it track and stop because it is based on this uh, tracking sampling rule. And for the stopping rule, so I, I, I didn't want to give too much detail, but our idea is to, to use a generalized likelihood ratio test. So the idea is that we stop when, for the current empirical best arm, uh, we would reject the hypothesis that it is different from all the, the other arms. And it turns out that this uh, uh, stopping statistic can also can be written in the following way. So this is not the way we use to really compute, compute it, because he, there is also, of course, an efficient way to, to compute it. But this is just to draw the link with the optimization problems that appeared uh, in the lower bound, because you, you understand that if this is close to your W star, then this quantity will be close to your, your T star. So this is just to give uh, the idea of uh, why, why it works. And of course, when we stop, I don't say it, but you recommend the empirical best arm. And uh, what we proved is that so when delta is small, the expected number of samples used by this algorithm is of order t star multiplied by log 1 over delta. So analysis is asymptotic, but if you actually run the track and stop uh, algorithm that you can do, you realize that it's uh, halving the, the sampling complexity of any uh, fixed budget algorithm I know. So it's also practical. Also, we have some progress to make in a, in a clean analysis, I would say. Uh, OK, so to wrap up on the difference between uh, these, two, uh, these two settings, we saw that so algorithm for regret minimization and uh, the particular best identification problem I consider are quite different because uh, if you look at the, just the sampling uh, strategy, for a regret minimizing algorithm, the fraction of draw of any suboptimal arm is going to tend to zero because the optimal arm is massively drawn and the other are only drawn of order log t. Whereas uh, for best arm identification, the fraction of draw is going to converge to this optimal proportion. And you can visualize this uh, in a picture in which I represent uh, so the end of the run of uh, the KLUCB algorithm on the, on the left. Here you can see the number of times each arm are drawn and the confidence interval you can build with these samples. And you see that the regret minimizing algorithm has a very good estimate of the best arm, but very poor estimates of all the other. Whereas here I, I took some best arm identification algorithm, we see that uh, all the leading R are sampled uh, uh, much more. And also in terms of uh, theoretical guarantee, actually the optimal uh, regret rate has a very explicit uh, uh, form in terms of the sum of uh, inverse kullback leibler divergence. Uh, whereas in the best time identification, we also had uh, an information theoretic complexity term, but it needs to, to resort to uh, an optimization problem that has no closed form uh, in, in general, even in the Gaussian case. Okay, so despite 
this, uh, these differences, I now want to answer the following question. So can pure exploration tools be used within regret minimizing algorithm? And this brings me to the last part of this talk in which we're going to discuss the performance on uh, explored and commit uh, strategy. So first, sorry to disappoint you, but I'm, I'm going to go back to a very simple case in which there will be only two arms, and I will assume that the arm are Gaussian with known variance one. So in that case, the Kullback Leibler divergence is simply a function of the gap, and so the complexity of the problem is fully characterized by this quantity delta, that is the difference uh, of the two means. So I just recap the, the optimality results we have in this particular setting. So uh, the lion robbins lower bound rewrites that uh, the regret divided by log t is lower bounded by 2 divided by delta, whereas the, opti the um, optimal rate for best time notification is that uh, if you want a delta pack, you will need a number of sample of order uh, 8 divided by delta squared log 1 over delta. And also, if you look at optimal algorithm for best time notification, you can also see that they, they need only to sample the arm uniformly. This is very specific to the, to the Gaussian case. And hence, it makes sense to consider uh, these explored and commit strategy as strategies that would uh, start by uniformly sampling the arm up to a certain stopping rule, then commuting to uh, some arm, usually the best so far, and playing this arm until the end of the budget. So this is how I define an ETC strategy. And actually, the, it's pretty easy to give an upper bound on the regret of such uh, strategy. So here I will assume that uh, mu1 is larger than mu2. In that case, the regret is simply the gap multiplied by the expected number of draws of the suboptimal arm uh, 2. And th the suboptimal arm has been drawn half of the time during the exploration phase. And then, if you commit to this arm, you draw it until the end of the budget. So this is uh, uh, equal to the number of draws of 2. And hence, the regret is upper bounded by delta div divided by 2 multiplied by the expectation of the stopping rule, plus uh, tau delta multiplied by the probability of a wrong commit. So then a natural candidate for such an algorithm would be to use the best time notification algorithm we have. So it would be to use, a, so we take an algorithm matching the previous bound and we use the, his stopping rule and its uh, recommendation rule. And of course we have to, to, to tell which value of delta we want. And if we choose delta to be one over t, then this term will become the constant. And the expected uh, sample complexity, we said it was of order 8 divided by delta squared log t. And so putting things together, we get an upper bound on the regret that scales in 4 divided by delta log t. So this is exactly twice higher than the lion robin lower bound. So the question now is, is this the best possible way to use to design an explore and commit strategy. And to get the answer, actually, we, we have to spend a little time on lower bound. And so I want to give you a flavor on how we derive lower bound uh, for a bounded problem in this particular two-armed case. So the idea is always that of a change of distribution. So um, we want to lower bound something on a bounded model mu. Well, we're going to consider another bounded model lambda in which the algorithm is supposed to behave differently because the optimal arm is not the same in the two models. And um, if we fix, if we look at uh, some uh, stopping time uh, such that the number of draws of arm 2 is uh, uh, measurable with respect to, the, to this stopping uh, time, then we can prove, uh, we prove the following lemma that will be then uh, simp simple to use to derive lower bound that says that uh, so the expected number of draws of 1 multiplied by here, the kullback leibler divergence between mu1 and lambda1, plus the expected number of draws of 2 multiplied by the kullback leibler divergence between mu2 and lambda2. So this quantity divided by log t is asymptotically larger than 1. So where does it come from? Uh, actually, uh, upstairs here, uh, this is to be interpreted as the expectation of the log likelihood ratio between so the observation under mu and the observation under lambda. And so all we have to prove is uh, the following. 
And actually, just by definition, the expectation of uh, the log likelihood ratio is a killback Leibler divergence between so the distribution of the observation under mu and the distribution of the observation under, under lambda. And then, by some trick involving the data processing inequalities that are fully detailed in this uh, paper by Aurelien, uh, you can see that this is smaller than uh, the binary relative entropy between so the expectation under mu of z and the expectation under lambda of z for any uh, f sigma measurable uh, random variable. And then the idea is to apply this result to uh, the random variable z, uh, which is uh, the fraction of draws of arm two. And uh, the model mu was chosen such that uh, arm two is drawn little, so this will tend to zero. Whereas in the model lambda, arm two is now the optimal arm, so this will tend to, to one. So, uh, and then we, we can look at the asymptotic behavior on this, and we can show that this is equivalent to log t using the uniform efficiency assumption. So it's a, it's a kind of a sketch of the proof, but the point is how do we use this kind of results? Actually, it's pretty uh, classical to rederive the line robin's uh, lower bound from here. So the change of measure that is considered is you take arm two and you move it just slightly ab above arm one, and you apply this result to the stopping time sigma equal t. But what I want to explain is how do you derive lower bound for ETC strategy? This is actually slightly more subtle. So first, we are going to ch choose a change of distribution that are, is going to move both arm one and arm two somewhere in the, in the middle with a little shift here so that in this new problem lambda, uh, arm two is now optimal. So we fulfill this uh, uh, constraint of changing the optimal arm. And then if, you, if we pick the stopping rule in the lemma to be uh, the minimum between uh, so the stopping rule of the algorithm and uh, t, Actually, upon stopping, we know exactly how many times we're going to draw arm two until the end of the budget. So we have this condition. We have that the, num the total number of draws of two is measurable with respect to the filtration uh, f, uh, f sigma. And so we can apply the lemma. And here, the two KL terms, they will be equal both to uh, uh, delta plus epsilon squared divided by eight. Then we can regroup these two, and we get the expectation of our stopping time. And then to get from here a lower bound of the regret, one simply remarks that the regret is lower bounded by uh, uh, delta divided by two multiplied by uh, the expectation of the stopping rule. Because we have at least to draw the suboptimal arm during the, uh, the exploration phase. And so what we prove is that any ETC strategy has to have its regret lower bounded by four divided by delta. And we, we already said that uh, any optimal best arm identification algorithm with delta equal one over t is matching the bound. But actually, in the paper, we propose a, a slightly better strategy. So, uh, so an optimal best time identification will uh, basically stop when the distance between the empirical mean exceeds some threshold. But here, we propose a modification of the threshold, where here, in place of the usual log t, we get log t divided by the number of uh, observation. And this permits to show the fine result here, in which we give a finite time upper bound on the regret. In where here, interestingly, we have a t uh, delta square. And this will help us to derive also a minimax optimal upper bound. Uh, so actually, the thing is that when delta is small, you may not be interested in this result because it is very large. But what is also true is that the regret is always trivially upper-bounded by delta multiplied by t. And so taking the minimal of these of this two terms, you can get this kind of uh, distribution independent result. And here, we don't get the usual extra log t that we can get if we don't have this kind of terms in the problem of the regret. So this is a small best of both world result because we are optimal, uh, we are matching the line robins uh, uh, rate, but we have also a, a good uh, uh, minimax uh, result because this is a lower bound in the, the minimax uh, problem. Uh, OK, so to conclude on this uh, ETC algorithm, actually, we showed that in the simple case of Gaussian two-arm bandit, ETC are twice 
uh, at least twice worse than the best uh, possible uh, UCB uh, algorithm. And so the, the message for people doing uh, A-B testing would be, I mean, if you have to, two products that you want to present to customer, rather than starting by an A-B testing phase and then always presenting the best at the end of the day, you should do UCB with your two products uh, all day long. Uh, OK, so this is a message in a simple uh, bandit problem. Of course, this has to be uh, uh, extended to bandit model with uh, more arms. And uh, especially, I think it might not be easy to understand how does the combination of an optimal best arm notification followed by exploitation compares to an uh, optimal uh, algorithm for regret minimization. Because we can give uh, a, a, an upper bound on the regret of those algorithms, but it's very hard to see at first sight how this compares to the Lion Robbins optimal rate. And with this, uh, I conclude with some reference. Thank you. So, a quick question. Uh, in your force exploration phase, when you're pulling every arm, I think it's square root of t times. Mm -hmm. Is square root of t, is that just any, can that be any sequence that goes off to infinity, or is square root of t? I, I think you should, yeah, you should take t to some power. Log t wouldn't be enough. And actually, this uh, force exploration phase is needed, because you can find, uh, it's not just a trick for the, for the theory. You have to enforce that all armor is drawn, because otherwise, sometimes you, it doesn't happen a lot, but you can find uh, uh, issues if you don't add uh, a sufficient exploration phase. I was just wondering, how is the last uh, serum that you presented different from what Vianney and Philippe did? Um, in the paper, Bandit with uh, covariance? Uh, actually, it might be... Uh, I'm not sure they used uh, this... Uh, for, for sure, the algorithm is different. And so I, I know that they, they already, uh, so I learned from them that you should have the t uh, delta square to have also the, the minimax rate. Uh, what is for sure different is that we are matching Lion Robbins and they are not. But I'm pretty sure that indeed uh, they get also the, the root t with some constant in front of them. So here the difference is that we are minimax optimal, but we are also problem dependent optimal. Let's thank uh, Emily and uh, Romain.